everyone. Thanks for spending the next 30 minutes with us here on Health and Family. Many of you are familiar with the St. Baldrick's Fundraiser, but what really goes into it being one of the year's biggest events? Joining us today are two ladies. One is a frequent visitor to Health and Family, Mrs. Azure Williams, who is the event and program manager with the Bermuda Cancer and Health Center. The other lady is Miss Victoria Canale, chairperson for the St. Baldrick's Fundraising Committee. We thank you both for joining us. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with you, Ms. Canale. What exactly is the St. Baldrick's Foundation? I know a lot of people know, but for that one person that doesn't know, tell us what sure. it's all about. So um, the St. Baldrick's Foundation is an association, charitable association, that came about to um, raise funds in order to process research for childhood cancers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so who is St. Baldrick's? So St. Baldrick's is not a person. Okay. <laughs> um, St. Baldrick's is sort of a play on words from St. Patrick's Day. So when the three founders uh, decided late one evening while they were out celebrating St. Patrick's Day um, and one of them had a specific effect from childhood cancer, um, at the time they did a play on words and created St. Baldrick's Day post sort of the initial first shave that night. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so traditionally, it's celebrated around St. Patrick's Day. Absolutely, yeah. All right. So give us a brief um, organ uh, uh, history of the organization. Okay. Um, so it, it first started in Bermuda in 2002, um, and I believe the founding um, organization uh, started in 2000 um, in the U.S. Um, it was uh, three gentlemen, like I said, that all worked within the same industry and one of them was being directly affected at the time. Um, so through conversation and um, some funds that flowed freely that night, um, St. Baldrick's was founded in a bar. Um, and so it has really grown throughout the U.S. and North America. Um, and we have some um, other charities worldwide that can be linked to it as it sort of gained momentum. Um, but the goal is you, you enter yourself to get your head shaved um, and you uh, raise funds um, and then all of those funds go back into St. Baldrick's and those are, St. Baldrick's then gives out the research grants or funds the research grants with different hospitals and doctors and organizations to look to um, find different ways of treating and ultimately cure, excuse me, childhood cancer. Okay, so you mentioned that we started a chapter here in Bermuda in 2002. Mm -hmm. Where is the head office located? Well, for Bermuda, we're linked with Bermuda Cancer and Health, okay. um, but overseas it's in California. All right. Specifically, just in California? Or? Yeah, just in California. Right. So, come to you, Mrs. Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the connection between Bermuda Cancer and Health and the St. Baldrick's Foundation? Well, 10% of the funds raised are awarded to Bermuda Cancer and Health Center via a grant, and the grant completely funds our SunSmart program. Mm. So, yeah, we're very different. fortunate, yes, we're very fortunate that our program was chosen as a candidate for this grant and for the funds and we are the only center that, or organization that has an education program that is directed towards youth and young adults and the specific cancer that is highest in youth and young adults is skin cancer. So we focus on skin cancer awareness and prevention through our program. So besides the Sun, the Sun Smart program, are there any other programs that have benefited from the link up? Yeah, well, we, our SunSmart program um, is the main program, but we also have our SunSmart accreditation training program, okay. which is also underneath it. Alrighty. And so why do you think, coming back to you, Ms. Canelli, why do you think some people participate in cutting their hair? I mean, that's a scary thing. No. However, it, I know, you said you mentioned that you did it before. Yeah, so two and a half years ago, and it grows back. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think that it is a really gratifying feeling to do something so selfless. Um, I think that it, it really feeds one's soul mm -hmm. to give back. Um, you know, you can't help but 
have the strings at your heart tugged on when you hear these stories of little beings, you know, that are um, going down the road of treatment, that have discovered that they have cancer, their families. And so it's one way to support. It's temporary. It does grow back for most of us. I mean, older gentlemen, maybe not so much, but <laughs> <laughs> you would be surprised how many older gentlemen there are that are nervous to shave it off. But um, yeah, so I, I think the fact that you're doing something so selfless for somebody else, I think is really appealing. And, and you get a lot out of it yourself, Absolutely. without a doubt. Yeah. How do the people, the young people with cancer, how do they react to this, to this act? Um, depending on their age, of course, because you know, we've had a three-year-old that has been involved in the program that doesn't, you know, he's just kind of excited by the, the lights and the noise <laughs> and the atmosphere versus, you know, um, a 12 or 13-year-old that does kind of get caught up in that emotional, happy emotional um, give back. So I think that um, most of them are really excited to just have other people a part of what they're going through. So you mentioned that a lot of people, it, it's popular here because yeah. a lot of people get a lot out of it. What other reasons do you think it's, it's caught on like fire here? Really, it's, it's huge here. Yeah, I mean, it grows every year. And I think, you know, apart from everybody wanting to give back, I think it's just, you know, it, it, you create a family, right? So there is this giant community of, at, at one point, bald people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and everybody continues to stay in touch, you know, um, even when we, when we kick off um, months before preparing for an event mm -hmm. um, annually, we have, you know, meet and greets and it just kind of grows by each meeting and you have repeat people come, come back, repeat shavies come back from previous years and they want to talk to and they want to give advice on, you know, make sure that you put the sunblock on your head days after or, Dude, you know, that. yeah. yeah um, and so, you know, like most things, I think you create a community. Um, and I think people really just um, aspire to be part of that. I can speak from, from being in the school system when I see the children come back to school after. They're kind of, kind of self-conscious and then once they get all the accolades, like, wow, this is a great thing. They're proud, they're like, yes, I did it and I'll do it again. So that's good kudos to you guys for doing this. Back to you, Mrs. Williams. What are some of the, the more prominent childhood cancers that are out there? Um, yeah. the, definitely the most common is leukemia. Right. Then you have brain and spinal cord tumors, you have neuroblastoma, Wilms tumors, um, and then the fifth top one is um, lymphoma, so non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's. Um, very common, those are the ones that you see the most. There are over a dozen childhood cancers, and then underneath those dozen, there are several more. So it's, I mean, the amount of cancers that exist today are endless. Um, and unfortunate, it's unfortunate that anyone has to go through this. But then when we're looking at little people and, you know, they're so tiny and they mm -hmm. go through this struggle, um, thank God for places or actually foundations like St. Baldrick's because they have been steadfast in making sure that they're constantly pushing, raising funds for research. And then those doctors and all their teams that are out there doing all this research to find the appropriate suitable treatment so it can be a speedier recovery time period for children. I mean, it's, it's amazing what the research is coming up with and the only way they can do this, do this is through places like St. Baldrick's, yeah. So you mentioned leukemia as being one of the, the more prominent ones. What exactly is leukemia for, for people that may not know? So it's actually, uh, actually covers about 30%, so that's why it's the highest. It covers most of the childhood cancers that are out there. And it is a cancer of the bone marrow and blood. And it can cause nausea, fatigue, weakness. Um, it's so many things when it comes to leukemia. And even though it is most common in children, we've known of some young adults who actually have been diagnosed with leukemia as well. So if, if they show any of those symptoms, we should try to get them checked out as soon yeah, as definitely. possible. Also mentioned were brain tumors. Um, do we have any stats here locally on that? Unfortunately, we don't, but we do have a known case of a young lady who was age 13 diagnosed with a brain tumor. And um, she was able to receive treatment and um, she has actually surpassed the five-year mark. Okay. So she survived and to date, considering all things that go on with 
cancer patients in general, she is doing well considering all that she's been through. Talk to us about some of the side effects of, of the cancers with the children that you mentioned, um, some about the lethargic and so forth, if you could just get right. into that. So um, when it comes to treatment, whether it's surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy, there are many effects that the treatments can have. Um, Short-term effects, yeah, they'll have hair loss, mm -hmm. they'll have um, diarrhea, vomiting, you know, all of that is, is part of it in general. And then some of the long-term effects would be when the cells stop growing normal cells or they don't grow as they should. And this is quite common, but it doesn't necessarily happen to everyone. Mm -hmm. And um, the side effects vary depending on the type of cancer that the um, patient's diagnosed with. I can imagine this has got to be devastating for the families of, of these young children. Are there any type of support services for them out there? Currently on island, we don't have any support groups directly related to childhood cancer. Mm -hmm. However, most of the childhood cancer patients travel overseas. Okay. And while they're overseas, they connect with other families right. and then they may, most of them maintain those connections and they're able to um, stay in touch. Uh, we've heard of different people, um, you know, families that we've been in contact with through St. Baldrick's and knowing that um, they've maintained, some of them, a really solid relationship mm -hmm. with families they've met overseas and they call each other up and they support each other that way um, because some of the children don't survive their treatment oh and it, it gets really bad for some families and we know of some Bermudian families that have kept in contact with those families who've had it really really hard, yeah. And so we mentioned that uh, a lot of the young children in schools are participating uh, with the Shavy. Yeah. Does, does, do they understand the concept of, of why they're doing this and for who they're doing this for? Yeah, I think most of them do, right. um, you know, to, to see their peers and they're not just, they're not just schoolmates. You know, we have a lot of kids in Bermuda that are involved in sporting activities. Um, and so, um, you know, we've had Shavies in past years that have come out to support their team member. Um, you know, at, at a young age. Um, there was one time that we did a school presentation and, you know, the first kid to volunteer themselves to shave was one with a learning disability. Right. Um, which okay, is, hold on to that sure. story. We're going to yeah. take a break and sure. we'll be right back. At the St. Baldrick's Foundation, we do one thing and we do it well. We fund childhood cancer research so kids diagnosed with cancer can live long and healthy lives. With so little of U.S. federal funding going towards childhood cancer research, private donors are the main sources for helping to find the cures for these kids. That's why we need you. Think of the years that we could give a child. Years that a child could grow up, marry, and have children of their own. Create something beautiful the world has never seen. Win a gold medal. Become a world leader. Or even discover a cure for cancer. Quite simply, to offer kids with cancer a lifetime without cancer, we need your help. Get involved to give them a lifetime of possibilities. Sign up now. And we thank you for coming back. Our focus today is on the St. Baldrick's fundraising efforts and its purpose here in our community. And we're going to start back up with Ms. Canelli. She uh, was talking to us about a child who was really into it. So continue yeah, on with your yeah, story. So, um as I was saying, it was the first kid to volunteer themselves to participate in St. Baldrick's after a presentation that we had made at the school. Um, and he had a learning disability. And so your question was, your question was, <laughs> how, do, um, how do they sort of get on board and sign themselves up? And I think at the end of the day, even if they don't have a full understanding of it, yeah. um, I think what it comes down to is it's a human doing good for another human. Um, and I think across all languages, across all ages, um, and across most circumstances, people understand that, they feel that. Um, and so we do find that we get a lot of kids on board wanting to participate because they want to help. Would that be your biggest um people that participate, the children, or is that across the board? No, um, it's certainly increased, I'd say, in the last four years. Um, the committee uh, made efforts to go out to the schools um, in the last few years and really try and recruit because again I think that there's a lot of value and a lot to be said for kids supporting other kids um, but our biggest fundraisers are usually adults mm -hmm. um, 
they have the connections, they have the established relationships in order to fundraise. Um, and of course, that's the, the most um, important part of participating and becoming a shavy. It, it's wonderful that people want to get up there and shave their heads, but the fundraising component is really what makes the foundation tick. Mm -hmm. um, we rely on those monies to forge ahead and find better ways of treating kids with cancer. So let's talk about some of the creative ways um, that, that the shavies or the, the participatory process uh, deals with. I know there's some parties, if you could just de deal with that for a little while. Yeah, so um, specifically we had a family, family this past uh, 2018 event. Um, they had their son uh, that was affected directly and he's gone through uh, two, two years, give or take of treatment since finding out that he had been diagnosed with a childhood cancer. Um, and so leading up to the main event um, in March, the family put on a couple of other events to fundraise. Uh, so they did um, like a, a sip and shop evening, mm -hmm. um, a ladies evening. Um, they also did uh, live entertainment and silent auction, you know, a month before at another venue. Um, and so it was like a ticketed event um, that they were responsible for sort of putting together and fundraising. Um, and they raised, uh, I think over a, a quarter of a million dollars wow. by themselves. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Locally, how many people, uh, could, could you give us the stats, like how many people participate on a yearly basis? Yep, so we hit roughly around 40 on an annual basis at our main public event, which 40 is- 40 individuals? 40 yeah. individuals um, at our main public event, which uh, typically happens the day of or the day next to St. Patrick's Day. Um, and that's usually in a bar, um, which I know isn't th uh, the most appealing to a lot of our public <laughs> members, <laughs> but it is kind of where it started. That's the roots of St. Baldrick's. Um, and we have um, been very careful in selecting the bar that we do partner with, which has been Docksiders, um, because there is, you know, it's in the back room. It's away from sort of the main, main establishment. Um, and there's another access point for families and children that, mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we decorated and it looks very, uh, yeah, <laughs> it does. Very green. <laughs> very green, of course. And green, our... sparkly and full of helium, yeah. right? Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so, uh, the other school events take place at the schools. So when I bring up schools, we've had a number of schools on the island, MSA, Saltus is the longest standing school to participate. And so they actually shave their hair they at do. the school. Yeah. Okay. So it's, you know, sort of a morning event at the school on a Friday, let's just say. We try and partner up again on the same day that we do our public event in the evening. Let's talk about um, motivation. Yeah. Well, we've had BHS, we've had yeah. uh, Warwick Academy. Yeah. So it's a few schools um, yeah. that have been aboard. The, the public well. schools don't do it. Uh, uh, not yet. But, but we it's are coming. working. It is. It's coming. It's coming. coming. But yeah. we do get a lot of the public school students that do participate right. come to the public event, and that again, it's 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 really magical. We start off with the kids. I mean, two years ago, we had a four-year-old little boy mm. who just committed to his parents, and he was like, "I want to do this." And you think, four years old, do you really have an understanding? But he did. Um, his little sister, two years old that does everything that Big Brother does. She did it too. She also did it. And on the stage, there they go, and you know, so well behaved, she's sitting there not moving, and just, it was, it's magical to wow. see something like that, you know, this little two-year-old, and then, you know, the, and the night ends with, you know, a 60-year-old doing it, and it's really So, you, you said 40 people here in Bermuda uh, have participated. What about internationally? Well, let's say America. Oh, I'm so sure many. it's in, in the tens of thousands okay. per year. And so the hair, talk to us about the hair is being shaved and then the hair, what do you do with the hair then? It's up to the individual. Um, okay. So specific to St. Baldrick's, there's no mandate to do anything with the hair afterwards. Okay. Um, here in Bermuda, we have um, part, partnered in an unofficial way with Locks of Love. Um, and Locks of Love is an organization that um, has hair donated mm -hmm. um, and then they send it away to create wigs for children with hair loss. 
Is there any type of hair that's not accepted? Would you say like, uh, no? Um, I, I think very highly processed hair. Um, funny enough, we had a young lady very this- Very highly processed yes. hair. So I'm thinking, okay. you know, like super bleached okay, hair. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, so initially we thought, uh, or we, we didn't have the green light on donating dreadlocks. And this year, you know, we found out that we were able to, in fact. And um, we had a young lady who, um, I think in her words, she shaved off like her body weight's worth of hair. Oh, wow. um, she had long dreads. Wow. They went, you know, sort of wow. down her back and beyond. I hope, you, do we have a picture of that? We do. Yes, yeah, okay. we do. Yeah. We can see yeah. that at the end. She's amazing. Um, and she's also, I think, in the education system. Yes. Um, oh, so, yeah. She works with you. Yeah. yeah, so to, you know, it takes one person. It really does take one person okay. to... I think I've seen... Was there an article done on her? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. I think I've seen yeah. her. I mean, and even the schools, just piggybacking off of what yeah. Victoria was saying, the atmosphere when you walk into mm -hmm. the schools when they're shaving, I mean, it's... It goes from emotional to fun to emotional to fun. Um, you know, people cry because of the emotion they're feeling. I can imagine. I really can. Be I know, yeah. yeah, it's such a commitment, especially if you're a girl, a female, because, a doubt, yeah. you know, that's part of your pride. It's, it's something it's that you're true. attached you're to. Born, yeah. And um, so many of the young ladies that shave, it's a very emotional process. Um, the tears are coming, but when you speak to them afterward, they feel so good about Absolutely. giving back. You know, this is yeah. their small part that yeah. they're playing. The schools have music. Um, they make it really electrifying, as Victoria was saying. Then you have some of the salons who donate barbers mm -hmm. and hair cutters. And yeah, it's, it's a really great yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. talking about it, a young girl, um, about 10 years old, and she really, it was very emotional for her. And I would go to her school about once a week, and I would just constantly encourage her, like, you look great. But the hair does grow fast. Absolutely. It really, really does grow fast. Seriously, from week to week, I'm saying, I see growth, I see growth, I see growth. And she well, would be... Well, kids eat your vegetables <laughs> and fruits. <laughs> so, Ashley, I wanted to come back to you to talk about the connection between uh, the St. Baldrick's Foundation and your organization, Bermuda Cancer and Health. You mentioned SunSmart and the SunSmart accreditation. What else did you yes. want to talk to us about? So, basically, um, the grant that we're awarded um, via the St. Baldrick's Foundation allows us to have a full-time SunSmart coordinator who's dedicated um, to making sure that we go into the school. So we, go, we give free presentations mm -hmm. from preschool level all the way up to senior level. We do lunch and learns. We do um, done, various- I've seen you do the SunSmart, yes, yes great presentation. Um, we also do uh, community events, health fairs, and it also allows us to have free SunSmart accreditation training. So I mentioned that earlier in the training program we offer every June, every year, and it is a free training session to summer camps. So we focus on the summer camps because when we look at skin cancer, it usually hits young adults. And we want the young people to start practicing at a young age what it means to protect their skin they're in. So we've been going to the Endeavor program in addition to the summer camps and the SunSmart um, program has been fortunate to have hats, sunscreen and sunglasses over the years because of the funding that we receive from St. Baldrick's. Okay, yeah. this is gonna be one of our last questions, actually the last question. Talk to us about the research on childhood cancers. Where are we now? Uh, are we so making the progress? So research is steadily ongoing and Fortunately, over, due to the research of the last few uh, decades, we have seen 80%, an 80% increase in the five-year survival rate. Because mm. before, I would say in the mid-1970s, uh, the survival rate was about 58%, and now we've gone up to 80%. So it's, the research is making a difference. It's bringing about more and more treatments, and we're seeing children live longer and surpass the five-year mark. Fantastic. And I think just to piggyback on that, St. Baldrick's is really very good at continuing to keep you up to date with their progress monthly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ladies, for, for this. This has been fantastic. My pleasure. All righty. We thank you for joining us today. If you're thinking about participating in this wonderful fundraiser, I hope this program will urge you to do so. 
We leave you now of some pictures of individuals who have participated in the St. Baldrick's fundraiser. I'm Shay Dawn Burgess, and this has been Health and Family. Thank you.